Uh, hi, everybody. I want to actually uh, dedicate this class in memory of someone who, who I definitely see as a, uh, a mentor of mine, someone who I respect very much for everything that uh, he did for our community. Tremendous respect also for his family, who's very well known in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yitzkertz Alva Shalom passed away just a little more than a week ago. Uh, was well known. His family is well known. His mother was actually a professor here at York University for many years. Uh, my wife was in his class, an outstanding, outstanding professor, outstanding teacher. To have a woman, uh, an Orthodox woman, who taught in the academic world was almost unheard of, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Just shows you what type of individual, what type of family, really, it is. And uh, I just want to dedicate in memory, his uh, Hebrew name is Yitzchak Tzvi Meir Ben Binyamin Shraga Faivo, and of course, at the same time, our thoughts and our prayers are, are also with uh, our fellow fellow Jews in Paris and in France who are going through a very difficult time right now. And if you saw the pictures, I'm standing in front of Jewish day schools or army soldiers, something which maybe in Israel they're a little bit used to, but definitely not in um, in Paris. And so, hopefully, over there things will begin to to come down, and there'll be some type of I don't know what exactly some type of conclusion is going to lead to over there, except for maybe all the Jews of Paris making Aliyah. Um, but hopefully, at least it'll, be, it'll lead to some type of uh, safety and tranquility. Can you just close the door, if you don't mind, just for the noise factor? Thank you. Okay. I want to ask a number of really difficult questions, and we'll see where this is going to take us to. No, question number one. We know that at the beginning of this week's Torah portion, <coughs> in this week's Parsha Shavua, is the beginning of what's called the Ten Plagues. The ten makot. And like, I don't understand, what do you need ten for? Like, if the goal is to have the Jewish people leave Egypt, have Paro go to sleep, and have the Jews get up and just walk out of Egypt. And at the same time, have the Egyptians get like a good night's sleep. You know, like, what's the big deal? The Jews can get up, they can take their time, have the Egyptians sleep for three days, not the way they ended up leaving. Why is it? that God felt it was necessary to have ten different plagues. What is the goal? What is the objective of having ten plagues? And they're stretched out in this story portion, next story portion as well. That's question number one. Question number two is, there's a lot of things that are very strange. I'll give an example. Um, every morning, well, six days a week, basically, Jewish men wear tefillin. And in these boxes of tefillin are four parts of the Torah. Now you'd think, wow, like what's going to go into the tefillin? They're going to be like the highlights, like the most important part of the entire Torah, right? So I'll give you an example. Anyone know what's in the boxes of tefillin? Shema, wow, Shema, I get it, Shema, right? I don't like saying the word hear is real, hearken, what is between hear and hearken? One is at, Shema doesn't just mean to listen. It actually means to listen and to obey, right? That's what the English word hearken, believe it or not, is better than listen, right? Not just listening. Shema doesn't mean to listen. Jews don't usually obey anything, right? It's much more than just listening. It's more like taking active and internalizing. The, ne- the next portion of Shema, Vayam Shema, it's also in there. And what else is in there? The last two? We also talk about Kol Bechor, right? The firstborn, uh, the firstborn also tr- take from next week's Parsha. And you know what else is in there? So... It also talks about a donkey that if you have to give the firstborn donkey and something's wrong with him, you break his neck. Um, and that's also in there. <laughs> what? Donkey? That's very strange. Like, why are like broken neck donkeys in the Tefillin? So we also appreciate that as well. And there's another major theme they want to highlight. And that is the theme of the firstborn. The word Bechor plays a very prominent role. One. When is the first time we see the word Bechor mentioned in, in Sefer Shemot? For the concept of the firstborn in the Exodus story? We just read it. What does God tell Moses? The Jewish people are? Come on, someone knows it. Firstborn My firstborn nation, Bini Bechori Yisrael. And because of that, Moses, God tells him, Go tell Pharaoh the following. Let my people go and worship me. Why? Because the Jewish people are my firstborn. Huh? 
And we know that what happens if God doesn't allow, sorry, if Paro does not just will to leave, God will smite Pharaoh's firstborn. That already is what's said by the sneb of the burning bush that we read a couple days ago. What's going on? Firstborn, ten makot, breaking donkeys' necks. Right? There's a very strange things that are happening. Okay, Let, I want to demonstrate a couple of things that are that are that are that are really neat. One, if you want to show you're really powerful, like imagine, like close your eyes for a minute, like okay, I want to show I'm really powerful, right? Okay, so what could demonstrate that I'm really powerful? So I could like blow you all away in a millisecond with some incredible gust of wind that's gonna like knock you off your feet. By the way, do you guys see like there was like a video clip about a lady in Russia line, the wind was so strong it blew her off her feet? Anyways, whatever. So imagine I'm gonna produce a wind right now in this room, right? And all of you guys are just gonna fall to the ground, right? And I'll be showing you Greenberg the Great. Right? Like, wow, that guy's awesome. He can make this gust of wind. You see, it's not just about power and strength. Well, it might have something to do with it. There's something else that Paro needed to understand and appreciate. I'll give you the first time you can really see it clearly. There's the Maka of Tzfardea, frogs. Now, frogs are really annoying. They're like, frogs here, frogs there. There were frogs in the ovens, in the beds, and... Uh, Wherever, however that song goes, right, that my, my kids used to sing. Right? Frogs everywhere. Now, if you're in the middle of Tzfardeh and you go to Moshe and you're like, Moshe, these frogs are annoying me. When, if they're really bothering you, would you ask Moshe to get rid of the frogs? What would you say? No. Now. Like, I don't want these frogs now. Now, if you don't mind the frogs, you'd say like, Oh, I'm not even bothered by them. That's your best shot. That's all you can do. Come on. They're not bothering me at all. Bring it on. But here's what Paro says. Take a look at your piece of paper for a minute. On page, on source number five, by the way, I have tons of source sheets. So if you don't have one, let me know. I have like a gazillion of them. Sorry, I should have said that before. I have tons. So here's what, here's what, here's what it says. Look at these words. Source 5, I'm going to read verse hey, plus okay. I don't know, I mean, I'll, I'll translate whatever I read in case people have trouble deeper. Her emotional pharaoh, he's pa'ir alai le masaya tir le chalo vedacho le macha la chrida tsordim mi macha mi badacha rock barati sharna. Moshe turns to Paro and says, Hey Paro, when do you want me to get rid of these frogs that are with your servants and your nation and your houses and I will put them back into the Nile? And they will remain there forever? Look what Paro says. Look at the next line. What does Paro say? Vayomer? Tomorrow? If the frogs are driving Paro crazy, why does Paro say tomorrow? Wouldn't it make more of a rational argument to say, I don't like these frogs, I want them gone pronto? Why does Paro say tomorrow? If the frogs aren't bothering him, why doesn't he just say, come on, bring it on? Very, why does Paro say tomorrow? And look at the response by, by, um, by Moshe. Vayomer, kid varcha. Moshe says, as you have spoken. Laman teda, kien kashem And you will, laman teda, so now you will know that there's no one like our God. Huh? Wait a second. The fact that there were frogs wasn't impressive. But the fact that the frogs will stop tomorrow is impressive. Understand the problem? Why is it that Moshe tells Paro the fact that you want me to stop the frogs tomorrow, why does that prove the power and the might and the knowledge of God? What, don't the frogs accomplish that? No, says Moshe. By having them be removed tomorrow, that demonstrate he ain't Kashem Elokeinu. That's strange. Very strange. Okay. Hopefully I've piqued your curiosity a little bit. Next. Um, 
I can show you a number of different times in terms of, you know, today and tomorrow. Here, I'll give you another one. Let's go to source six. I'll show you another one that's very strange. This is the plague of Dever. Where, where was it? Oh, here we go. Verse 5, Pasuke. So, Perak test Pasuke. Vayas Hashem Mo'edli, more God sets a certain time. Machar Yas Hashem Hadavar Hazeh. Tomorrow God will do it. What's this tomorrow thing? Why not now? Why not today? Why not? And certain plagues actually happen right away. I don't know, if I had more time and if I had like a good, um, what's it called behind me, like a good uh, uh, screen behind me, I, could, I would sh highlight all the verses and all their times. And, Made some really nice fancy charts. Maybe some of you did that when you were in high school, right? But it's really neat to take a look at. There's a lot more to do this in greater detail. I'm giving you the, the abridged version. But if you want to, during one of your lectures, if you're really bored, take out the... I mean, you will be bored during your lectures. That's a given. It's like, but if you want to, when you're bored during your lecture, take out the verses in this exact parsha, and you can create all these different types of patterns. It's actually really neat. And one pattern, perhaps, that you're familiar with is the three sets of three. Um, we know at the Seder night, so we take our, uh, our finger and we remove wine every time we mention the ten different makot. And then what do we do? We say afterwards, that called Rabbi Yehuda, Hayo no ten behem simonim. Rabbi Yehuda, like, oh, he would do like an acrostic. Is that what it's called, an acrostic? A mnemonic device? An acrostic. An acronym. Mnemonic? An acronym. An acronym, that's better. Thank you, an acronym. You know, some people like, I remember people use acronyms to like remember like uh, things in science a lot, right? Like, you know, valences and compounds and stuff. Okay, maybe no one knows what I'm talking about. That's fine. So, what did he remember you to do? Oh, yeah, yeah, like an acronym. So, you'd remember the Makos. And what did he say? Ditzach Adash Bachav. It's the first letter of each one. It's clear. He is not just doing that because he wants you to remember them. I mean, perhaps he is educationally. He's saying much more than that. It's clear that there are three sets of three. Forget about the tenth one for now. Right? Clear. There's a common denominator in the first three, in the second set of three, and the third set of three. Right? And each one will have a different function. And each one will have a different pattern. I'll give you an example. See if I remember this. Plagues one, four, and seven, meaning the first one of each set, all happen in the morning. All happen in the morning. And all happen with a warning. Plagues two... Plague 5 and Plague 8, meaning the second one is set, all happen with a warning and all happen basically connected to like Paro's palace thing. Then you have Plague 3, Plague 6, and Plague 9, all happen, there's no warning. And at the end of each one of those sets, Paro and or Paro's henchmen make a statement. Not only that, but each set, the Torah has a different function for it. Let's, let me just show you a couple of examples. <clears throat> Take a look at this. Um, okay. Look at, let's just go to source four. First of all, In Pasu Tet Zayin, which is 16, from our Do me a favor, Moshe. Go to Paro, says God, and say him the following. The God of the Ivrim, the God of the Ibrus, sent me. Shalach at the of Dirbebar, go and send my nation to serve in the desert. Despite what Hollywood claims, Hollywood claims that what does Moshe say? Let my people go. Never happens. <laughs> Moshe never, in fact, if Moshe ever asks to let my people go, I will give you a million dollars. Never says it. It just makes a better show in Hollywood. Because what does Moshe always ask for? We have duty, go worship me in the desert. For every reason, it's Hollywood, so it can't be too religious. So instead, Moshe becomes this, like, freedom fighter. I mean, he is a freedom fighter, but instead he's asking for religious freedom. Why does he do it that way, and why, why does Moshe have to say, let my people go to serve me in the desert? Um, and why does he ask for three days? That's a topic for another time, maybe the next week. But we won't have as many people because I won't have sushi. So. Okay. <laughs> and he hasn't listened so far. 
Listen to these words. Bezog. With this you will know. Ki Hashem. I am God. Hine anuchi makeh b'matesher b'yadi alamay mesher b'yor v'echun l'dam. And you will transform the blood of the Nile. Sorry. You will transform the water of the Nile into blood. So, Moshe does it. Moshe, well, actually, Aaron, does it. And he transforms the water of the Nile into blood. Ooh, that's pretty neat. Now, what about the water everywhere else? What happens to the water everywhere else in Egypt? What happens to that water? Also blood. Right, because you learned that when you were six. But now the Torah says. What does the Torah say? Go to the next line. Now what is... Oh, sorry, I skipped that line. Huh? Okay, let's go to the next line. Let's go to the next line. Okay. You're right, that's, well, that's what you were told, but tell me what it says. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me, I'll read what the Torah says. It says that they dug around here. What does it say? Let's read the Torah. The Torah says, here. Water, here. Eric, in the Chaptal. 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 Here. I'm Chaptal, thank you. That, did you have Chavdal there? Oh, you did. There you go. It says right there. What did they do? They were forced to drink non-Nile water. Because the Nile water was blood. So what did they drink? Non-Nile. I thought it says in the Torah, right? So the Midrash said that no, it was all the water. But it appears that they were able to drink water from elsewhere. Now, why specifically would God show that the Nile has been denied. So it's now denial, huh? Right? That's a bad joke. So, why? Why is God attacking the Nile? Answer? Because they worship the Nile. The Nile, remember, in the ancient world, the Nile wasn't just a god, but often in the ancient world, the god was the economic resource of the time. The Egyptian community lived around the Nile. Why? Because it was a permanent source of water. It provided Egypt with a tremendous sense of agriculture, which then led to economic prosperity. And when you have economic prosperity, you could then rule and have dominion and have all those things. But that gave Egypt a tremendous sense of power. Okay? And that is what, specifically, remember... Laman teda. What's the purpose of these makot? Is to know I am God. Now, that message is to Paro specifically. Why? Why is it this message had to be taught to Paro and to the Egyptians specifically? Paro saw himself as as a god. Flip to the back of the page for a minute, which I actually meant to say just the second page. In Yechezkel, it says, source number nine. This is a nevuah that takes place hundreds and hundreds of years later. So interesting. Paro saw himself as a great tanim. Maybe that's a crocodile. Maybe that's an alligator or some type of whatever. He sees it as a, that this tanim is one that hovers or swims or crouches in the middle of the Nile. Asher Amar, who says, meaning Paro says, Li Yori Vinyasitani. I am the Nile and I created it. Meaning, why specifically are we attacking the Nile? Because the king, Faro, Paro, saw himself as I am the Nile. I created the Nile. And God's message is wrong. Uh, try again. Now, the Midrash says, why did Paro every, early in the morning, go to the Nile? Why? Choose the washroom. So what is the Midrash trying to say? The Midrash is trying to say, that, and it's quite ironic, right? Like, the Nile is like their demigod, and he defecates in the god. That's a little disgusting, Right? Although, there was a type of pagan worship in those days, right? Yeah, because he knows it's false. He knows it's false. 
So to some extent, we see the irony. The irony here is that Paro, the Midrash is saying that the Paro goes to the Nile to hide the fact that he's not really the God. And where does he do it? In the place that's looked upon as a God, as a source of power, as a source of pride, as a source of economic prosperity. Now specifically, Moshe goes, goes out there. Okay. Now, go and greet him. Good. So, one plague. Next plague. Tzfardim. We kind of dealt with Tzfardarity. They were able to do Tzfardaya. Get rid of it. I told you about tomorrow. Didn't listen. Okay, next. Kinim. So done to that At the end of Kinim, so we're going to see something fascinating. What happens at the end of Kinim? Kinim or lice. Bothers the eight people. Bothers the animals. Take a look at Yudalit. Source 5 Yudalit. Chet Yudalit. First page. And the sorcerers, the henchmen, were able to copy the exact thing. <coughs> Tempted to do kirim. They weren't able to. When it comes to frogs and blood, that can be replicated. That's not so complicated. But when it comes to the kirim, they were, were not able to replicate such a, such a power, such a uh, plague. And again... What we see here is, take a look. The first time we see some type of recognition on behalf of the other team. Right? The Egyptians said, this is the finger of God. What's the finger of God? Not God himself, a little bit of power, something, a small pinky. Right? They recognize there's something, we can't do this. There's something... Different, unique, special what's going on here. Again, we spend a lot of time on when it says there's a lot of this hardening of the heart and strengthening the heart and stubborn of the heart, but that's maybe for another time. And again, that's the end of the first set. Again, the next set begins with get up early, go to Paro, in the morning, to the water, right? That's how the next, that's how the fourth Makkah begins, just like the first Makkah began. Let's skip around a little bit. Now, we're going to see something very different. Look at verse 18, top of the page. Viflesi vayomahu. What's viflesi? I will make a distinction. And there's Goshen. Asher ami omer aleha levoti sham arov. Leman teda kin yeshem bekevaretz. Visamti fidut. And I'll make a... Sorry, that's a distinction. Bein ami venamecha. Lemachar ye otazeh. For the next set of makot, ladies and gentlemen... We see something unique. And God specifically says there'll be a difference between the Jews and the Egyptians. The Midrash says it happened even for the first three. The Torah doesn't say that. The Torah says that specifically there'll be a distinction only in this set. I will make a difference. I'll make a distinction. There will be Arov. There'll be wild animals here. They're not going to travel over there. There'll be a distinction between Egypt and between Eretz Goshen. It says it every single time. Um, okay. Then they play a bit of it again. Again, with Aro, he talks about tomorrow. He goes out and in fact stops tomorrow. Okay, next day. I'll just show you again by Dever. Aro of Dever, yeah, by Dever. Again, the Torah says in verse 9, which is source 6, in Perak Tes, Pasuk Dalit, Viflashem ben miknei, so ben miknei mitzrayim. Right? And again, the Torah says, I'm making a distinction between the two camps, between Jews and the Egyptians. All right, that happens over there, it happens over there. Wonderful. And finally, you have, Arav Devash, at the end of Shechin, look what happens. Take a look, please, at. There we go. Uh, so I was reading before, so six. So I was in, it was in source six, right? Five, six, seven. Again, God says tomorrow. Again, the sense of repetition. They couldn't able to, the, the, the heart of me were not able to replicate it. Uh, God hardens Paro's heart. He doesn't listen. He will go. That's the end of Dunzakin. Good. Next set. 
This is a totally different set. Again, it begins with in your gimel the morning where Moshe goes to greet Paro. Look at this language. Look at your dalit. Keep up, This is totally different. This is the second set. Ani sholach et kol magefoltai al dibcha. My entire plague to, to your servants, to your nation. Ba'vor teda ki ein kamoni b'chol haaretz. We've now taken it to the third level, and this level is called "There's no one like me in all of the land." And again, then after these plagues, it, people will talk about my name, my reputation. Through these plagues, the Torah will say three times, "Never happened before with such magnitude, and will never happen again." And what is it? Barad comes up. What happens by Barad? Barad, something fascinating takes place in Kavdalid. There's Barad, there's Heo with fire. And that's what the Torah says. Never seen this before. Right? And Brock Bears Goshen, there was no Barad. Look at Parah's response. Barad does something which is transformative. In response to Heo, what does Parah say? I have sinned! Hashem HaTzadik V'ani Amir Hashem Why is it, ladies and gentlemen, that specifically after Baruch, up until then it wasn't so great, up until then, why is he saying, why is he now Chatati upon? Because Barad has something which is transformative. And the answer is, fire and water don't usually coexist. We see here the fact that there's fire and water together that seems to be very powerful to Paro. That is what impresses him. Not the fact necessarily, oh my goodness, I've never seen anything like this before. Meaning that the power of Barad, but it's the, because he doesn't say the same line after Arbe or Choshech, well, after Arbe, there's something about Barad having fire and water <coughs> coexisting together. That's not natural. It's not normal. Even more so than having a lot of frogs or having a lot of locusts. The fact that they're able to come together and work in tandem, which is to some extent against the rules of nature, has an effect on Paro, and that's why I believe he says, Okay. Um, find that the next round. Hardens his heart. Then we have... The Makkah of Choshech, uh, Arba, and the Makkah of Choshech, which never happened before. Okay, good. And again, all these times, that refrain is mentioned for the last three. Haterem Tidaki, oh, sorry. is mentioned, um, where's that refrain? Yeah, that, Again, the fact that what will happen is so shocking, everyone's going to talk about it. Everyone's going to talk about God's reputation. That's specifically by the last three. Okay, so we see here there's a progression. There's a pattern in the progression, 333. Makat Bechorah, ladies and gentlemen, actually has all these dimensions packed up into one. Um, it has the power, it has the might, it has the distinction. It has people going to talk about it forever as all. That's Makkah Bukhara. Now, there's a very strange midrash that people maybe are familiar with. What time did Makkah Bukhara happen? Anybody know what time that happened at? Midnight. At midnight. How is it midnight in Hebrew? Chatzos. Chatzos. Okay. Now, when Moshe, however, says at the Paro, he doesn't say midnight. He says. And everyone we learned when we were a kid like Chatzot. Now, why would Moshe tell Paro around midnight? Answer? Rashi says, because if Moshe would have told Paro that at midnight tonight all the firstborn are going to die, and it, instead they die at 1201, Paro would not have been impressed. It would have led to the desecration of God. Huh? Wait a second. You mean to tell me, if I tell you at 12 o'clock I'm going to levitate the Statue of Liberty and bring it and have it kiss the CN Tower and then put it back down in Statue of Liberty. And I tell you that's going to happen at 12. And it happens at 12. Oh, Greenberg's a goof. Right? 
Ah, if you'd have done it, he said 12. We did it 1201. He's just, are you kidding me? What do you mean one million? It doesn't matter. You, you, you hear my question? You hear my question? It's so silly. That's why we have to take what the rabbis say very seriously. Not always literally. What's the message? Go back to what we started with. Timing is everything. Time shows a tremendous power and ability. People who care about, people who are sensitive to time, you know, like timing is everything? Timing actually is everything. Or, I wouldn't say it's everything, but it's very valuable. What is the first mitzvah the Jews received as a national people? Rosh Chodesh. It's about time. A slave doesn't appreciate time. Paro understands that if God can control time, he's very much involved in this world. He cares about this world. Look at what happens in the plagues. Not just God who created the world. That doesn't move Paro. Create the world, don't create the world. Maybe yes, maybe no. Eh, impressive, not impressive. But can, is God still connected to this world? You're connected to this world if you're sensitive about time. If 12 versus 1201 makes a difference. Today versus tomorrow to stop a plague. Timing shows that God is still connected to the world. And not only that, but the fact that God can distinguish between location A and location B. To bring locusts is one thing, let them attack everybody. But the fact that they can remain isolated in an area, almost as if there's an invisible force field trapping them in an enclosed area, that doesn't just show God's power, it also shows God's control. It also shows and demonstrates how much love, care, and compassion he has for one group over the other. Trying to help the innocent and the slave versus the <laughs> powerful and the mighty. That shows God's care and concern. Now, why is it all about a firstborn? Why do the firstborn take such a prominent role? And I was talking about the donkey before and breaking the neck of the donkey. It's because in the Parsha of the donkey, it talks about the firstborn. The firstborn plays a dominant role already from the beginning and the outset. God tells us that his goal is, I want my firstborn nation to leave Egypt. And if not, I'm going to attack. What's his firstborn? Like, what does he have against? What's a firstborn? A firstborn. I'm not a firstborn. Just wanted to disclose that information right now, right? I'm the youngest in my family, right? So, but a firstborn is almost a quasi parent, right? Those of you that are not firstborn are happy to hear that, right? In fact, you're obligated to respect your oldest and older sibling, right? Sorry, people, right? Don't abuse that power, right? The firstborn has a sense of greater responsibility. Doesn't mean they're better. They are just, it's a birth order thing. They have great responsibility. They're almost like, like I said, a mini parent. In fact, what's the reason why, according to the Torah, a firstborn receives twice, a firstborn boy receives twice as much? The answer is because he needs twice as much money to take care of the rest of his family. Because when his father passes away, he's in charge of the rest of the family, including his own mother, according to the Torah law. So he needs more money because he doesn't just help his own family, he has it with his mother and his siblings, which is why he inherits twice as much. So the firstborn in the Torah is looked upon also as a mini Kohen. What's the job of a Kohen? And we know originally. Every family was going to have to dedicate the firstborn to work in the temple, in the Mishkan. That didn't happen because of Chet Egel. But the ideal isn't that one tribe will be separated to work, but every family will contribute a little bit. It's like, you know, like, well, I guess Jewish mothers say, well, one of my kids has to become a doctor. So really, it's one of my kids has to become a rabbi, right? That's like kind of the, the modern day equivalent, right? So what ends up happening is this idea of the firstborn. So God tells Moshe by the Sinai, it's really all about the firstborn. The firstborn often gets more attention from the parents. Benefits, you know, you know they, they're, the, they're there first. Now, that being said, the youngest kid also benefits a lot because like, they're usually spoiled and whatever. But anyways, at least my house, that's what it works. 
But what I think the message of the Makot are, one shot, when, it's not about power. It's not about showing off God's tremendous power, because God could zap the Egyptians, Bishop could walk out. It's an educational process. It's an educational process to educating Egypt, educating Paro, but educating us as well, thousands of years later. That God is still involved in this world. God so cares about this world. Timing is very... That is, that is one of the reasons why I believe time plays such a prominent role in Judaism. Right? And if you have, like, you know, compulsive behavior and stuff like that, so, like, it would be very bad for you because, like, you're very worried about, like, sunrise, sunset, that, you know, you're a little crazy about certain things, right? But, like, at the end of the day, time plays a viable role. You know, before I was, I was in before, and some women were in the back, they were davening. Oh, well, you're not davening mincha, it's too early, right? It's true, it was too early, right? Time plays a role. We know, when it comes to Shabbos, this second you can write, and a second later, or two, you cannot. Time plays an important role, right? I say become obsessed with time, right? Where, like, you know, you don't, you always come super early to everything, and people come two minutes late, you get mad at you. There's just something if a person's always late to things regularly and all the time, right? If a person needs to try to be on time, time is very precious. Time is the most precious commodity that I think we have. Again, one of the reasons why, as a nation, the first national mitzvah was Mitzvah Rosh Chodesh, because it is about time. If you control time, you control your future. You guys are all saying to yourselves, oh my goodness, it is only the second week of the semester. It has been second month, it's going by so slow. I guarantee you, I will turn to you in April and be like, oh my goodness, where did the semester go? A free person, time flies. A slave has no appreciation, time is irrelevant. Stand still. Which is why a slave is exempt, a non Jewish slave is exempt from time bound commandments, right? Well, it's a completely different reason. So I think that is what's happening in this week's Parsha and Exodus Parsha. That it's an educational process, it is being built up, it is not out to show off how powerful God is, but there's a message that God wants to teach, and again, not just to Paro, not just to Mitzrayim, although there is a message to them, but the message is as meaningful and relevant also to B'nai Yisrael, to us as well. And what God ultimately doing is He's saying, I love my firstborn, my firstborn are precious to me, that's the Jewish people, and therefore, I'm taking them out of Mitzrayim. I, it was like the, the cauldron that forged the people. And now I'm almost, I'm taking them out, taking out my firstborn, my, the nation that's going to have greater responsibility, the nation that's going to be a, hopefully a light unto nations. I'm going to take them out of Mitzrayim. I'm going to provide with them wonders. And hopefully on their way to becoming the nation that they're called upon to be, this is where it begins to happen, specifically um, in Egypt. And so I think that's a, a, an important message for us to remember and recall. It's not about, uh, you know, God showing off. There's no showing off needed at all. It's ultimately trying to demonstrate to the people and to the nation and to us about his love, concern, and compassion, really, for B'nai Israel. And this is part of the process, educational process, that he needed to teach almost the entire world to get us through to the next stage in becoming this independent nation.